Good evening, everyone. Welcome to CW Live. My name is Chris Webb, Head of Communications at the CW. We're delighted to have with me today Terry Pollinger, Deputy General Secretary. Good evening, Terry. Hello, Chris. Well, good to have you with us as, as always, mate. So we're here to give uh, an update to the Royal Mail Group members of the negotiations and the talks that you've been structuring and working on. Terry, before we do that, we want um, as much engagement from you as possible watching the session. So as it as the numbers build up, I want to let them go to as many as possible for Terry makes his statement. Please uh, like the post, please share it, please tag your friends in and let us know where you're watching from. Let us know how long you've been a, a, a member of the CW. And Terry, before you come launching in with your um, statement and your, your, your opening thing, just want to say on behalf of the whole union, congratulations. You've become a, a granddad again this week. Um, obviously, we, we can see the smile on your face there, um, which is great news. We've got, we've got Charlie. Uh, your, your son is a former member of Team Comms. It does a fantastic job for us. And Ellie, who's one of our reps um, in past support on the National Young Workers Committee. So, massive congratulations to you, mate, and all the family. Yeah. Thank Brilliant you, man. Uh, much appreciated. We're delighted, obviously. I can imagine, mate. So, Terry, it's been a couple of weeks since we've had the chance to um, sit down and talk to you. Would you like to give members an update on where we are? Yeah, absolutely. And as it happens, Chris, I, I've just literally just remembered this as you were talking now. I thought you was going to say this. It, although I was re-elected this year, it was actually five years ago today that I was elected DGSP. So not a lot has happened, does it, during, the, <laughs> <laughs> during, during those, uh, those five years? Um, but it's, you know, as always, it's an honour to represent people. So a landmark for me there. Um, well, and before I start, Chris, what I'd like to say is solidarity to all our members in BT from the postal side of the union and to the reps in BT, uh, the fellow officers and, of course, Andy Kerr, um, who holds the same position as me. I mean, that looks like a horrendous fight and I know the union's getting behind it. I know Dave, the general secretary as well, is we're getting out there and saying to members, hey, you got to back your union. And I'd like to re-emphasise that message, Chris. It's the... Wherever you are in BT, whether you work on your own or you work collectively somewhere or whatever, there is no one who won't be touched by, by the changes that BT want to bring. And whilst these are challenging times, you need a union negotiating wherever that change is to protect you. You've got to stick together. You've seen how we've done it on the postal side. The postal workers have backed this union three times now in massive ballots. And it's got us into the position that I'm just going to talk about today. That's, that's what the strength gives you. So rather than having change forced on you, you can negotiate change and protect your members. So every BT member, please, please, everyone, do not do not. If that comes to the point of a ballot, you, you get behind your union and make sure you vote and get a massive yes vote and give Andy and the rest of the team all the tools they need to go and work and protect you. Spot on, Terry. I'm sure I've been really well received. Lovely. Um, it's just now important is because we've had, we've been the three years, Chris, that uh, that we've been through or more um, has just proven everything we've always said when we've gone out to members meetings and asked people to get behind us. These were the reasons why. So I just want to remind people that when we secured uh, the four pillars agreement, that that four pillars agreement was a blueprint blueprint for change. We knew that change was coming down the line. There'd been a trend of declining letters, etc., growth in parcels. So we knew all that stuff was coming. We knew it would be challenging. And the Four Pillars Agreement sort of laid out how we would deal with it and that this union would genuinely have a chance to influence that future and, and produce mutual interest solutions as well as benefits for our members, benefits for the business. And as far as I'm concerned, that's where we are again now. I'm pleased to say after a hiatus of two years, which was so destructive and so unnecessary, in my opinion, if they'd have just stuck to that agreement and honoured its spirit and intent um, from the CEO down at that time, Rico, back, I think we'd be in a much better place, Royal Mail, even though we still wouldn't be immune to the challenges that, of course, uh, COVID and uh, 19, uh, et cetera, has brought to the, every industry in this country. And I want to set the backdrop for that because I've seen people that are already out there. Royal Mail have, have clearly been out. Uh, we've got their ambassadors that are out there uh, putting a message. And, of course, when we got the joint statement, Dave Ward and myself also came out and, and gave our message. Um, and uh, the ambassadors would have told our members, if you've had one of those meetings in your workplace, uh, what the financial situation is that the business is reporting, not just to us, but to the regulator, to the government, to shareholders, etc. 
and the challenges that this company faces. And they are serious, and I believe they are serious challenges, and they require a serious response, and they will always get a serious response uh, from this trade union. But I have to say, I genuinely believe it's not a time for panic. I genuinely believe we can work through what the, the, uh, the current challenges and the, uh, the changing dynamics of our industry, and we can come out the other side of it with all the spirit and intent of the Four Pillars Agreement intact, and we can also come out the other side of it protecting our members, uh, you know, their security, their employment security, their retirement security, and their standard living security. And they are massive boasts at this moment in time if you look what's going on around this country. Today, people are reporting that they believe unemployment will reach 4 million, uh, 400 million, was it, for the first time in this country. So, you know, millions of workers are fight, facing a challenge. What I'd say to our members in Royal Mail and BT members I've just spoke about would be able to recognise this. I believe that if it wasn't for the strength of this union, if it wasn't for the fact our members in Postal had backed us the way they did, we would not necessarily be in that room and have our chance to shape the future and shape the responses which protect decent working people and this great public service. I don't believe we would be in that room. I think there'd be a temptation, as there seems to be in every boardroom around this country, for knee-jerk reactions and laying off people, changing terms and conditions, trying to bring in people on cheaper terms and conditions, et cetera, et cetera. And that's being faced by a lot of people. That's not where we are at the moment. Where we are, and I'll take you back to the joint statement, the company is committed to all our agreements and all our agreements since 2010 onwards have, have all recognised the challenges, but have put in place all the protections that we need for you, our members, and to ensure that these things move forward in a measured way and the right way. And that's the position we're in now. So we've started, we've commenced the talks. And if anyone uh, has still got or has reread a copy of that joint statement, there's a massive amount of detail that we've got to work through. We've structured the talks now around the design of the joint statement. So there's a number of different talks taking place daily. There'll also be breakout ses sessions in the functions where the national officers and PC members and at times, our senior field officials and other people may well be involved. We're trying to get as broad as possible to make sure we get the right solutions uh, uh, and we get the right response to the challenges we, we face. So that's in setting up those structures, I have to say to you at this early stage, that there has absolutely been a change of attitude in this business, a stark change compared to where we were in the last two years. So the, the chairman and the chief executive uh, in making that joint statement, they have honoured what they said in there the same way we, that we have and that we will approach this in a positive way and in a genuine way to rebuild relationships and trust and to give people the confidence that their, their best interests are being looked after, uh, as I say, as we respond to these things. So that, thus far, without question, that has been honoured. That is the approach. Now, there's a lot of baggage. Definitely, there's legacy issues running right throughout our respective organisations. There'll be some people who don't want to let go of the dispute. Some people who might want to try and drag it back into the dispute. And that goes down from the very top right to the uh, right to the shop floor. And uh, we've got to ensure it will take time to fill it all down. But the key message from me today is that the talks so far have been very positive and people, we are genuinely being respected in the room and we're being listened to in the room. And I think there is a genuine desire at the very top to work with this trade union to find the right solution. Thank you, Terry. Um, I mean, it's a comprehensive update and we can see from the comments that it's been well received by the members. Uh, uh, one of the questions I had, you sort of touched on, and it's been put again by Andy Stott here, if I put it on the screen so you can see it actually. Uh, and Andy says the changes haven't filtered down to local and area managers. And we've also seen reports, um, and you've been receiving these as well, of the, the, the ambassadors that Royal Mail are using, taking somewhat of a bit of a license during their sessions and, and going off script and saying stuff like, you know, we might be looking at a three day year or so, there may be 20,000 job losses. You know, some people, I suppose they'll listen to you tonight and think that's great news, but 
not, not feel that yet in the workplace? What would your message to those people be? Yeah, my message would be I totally understand that. And I, and I think, um, you know, this is the time now, I, you know, we, we know how to measure our reactions to things. And this is the time for us to push now for solutions to uh, our dispute, to resolve our dispute, which is still there. And all the points are still there and they've all got to be, it's in the joint statement, they've all got to be dealt with and we will. And we are determined to sit in that room and keep, you know, explaining our position and intellectually engage to reach a mutual interest solution, which we've committed to at the highest level. So, but without doubt, you know, without doubt, I fully understand. I know the, the thing with the ambassadors, I've read their brief and there's nothing in their brief that, um, you know, hasn't, hasn't been presented, which is, which is okay with us as well. But of course the ambas ambassadors are, are encouraged to elaborate on perhaps on their experience uh whatever that level of experience is but they're encouraged to answer questions and i suppose try and put a human feel on it and what they think is going to happen so we've had feedback i've not had it formally but we've had anecdotally of you know some of the ambassadors talking about three-day uso and twenty thousand job losses and all that sort of stuff and i can assure everyone here that is not the conversation and those those figures and those that uh, that sort of structure has not been anywhere near in our talks. Our talks is our best to protect the USO. We all know that challenge. Ideally, we want to protect a six-day USO, um, but you can't ignore the, the decline in letters. And what we have to also take on board with things like that is it's not just us and Royal Mail. There's actually that's, uh, the regulators involved with that and ultimately the government because they're the ones who decide what the USO will look like. So... Um, you know, we've got to try and create as a positive environment around that as, as possible. And um, as for job losses, uh, as we go along on our journey and there's more automation for parcels, the same as we have done over the years, there'll be an, I don't really call it job losses. If it's done in line with our agreements, we'll have surpluses. And where we've got surpluses, we would want them dealt with on a voluntary basis, uh, voluntary redundancy, no compulsory redundancy which we've managed to achieve all these years and seven years into privatisation. So that's no mean boast by this union. I'm not so sure anyone else has been able to do that, but we have, and we even believe facing up to these challenges, we can continue to do that. So my message is don't panic. I mean, you're, you're going you're gonna to listen to what everyone's got to say. You're listening to me now. Uh, most importantly for me at this stage is, is not to overreact when I get a, a message from the field that someone who's uh, gone off message, if you like, or is uh, is potentially saying things that will maybe to deliberately get a response on either, either organisation, anyone doing that, then, you know, I, I just think people hold your nerve and trust that all the time I'm reporting to you, we're in the room and we're being dealt with in the right way. And as our agreements evolve, we will ensure, we constantly ensure that top of our agenda is culture. And part of that culture is trying to convince people like that that if they stay in this organised in this industry, then they're going to have to change their attitude. So as I say, some people have got legacy from the dispute. They they perhaps haven't got the ability to switch and get back in, uh, you know, progressive pragmatism and build the relationships that need to happen at local level. And ultimately, they'll be dealt with. But it will, that will t listen. It will take time. We've been in dispute for two years possibly one of the, if not the longest dispute in, in UK history. Both people get into their positions, into their trenches, however you want to describe it. And it's hard to get yourself out of it. And uh, no one was more voiceful than me in that during the dispute. So if I can do it, then I believe everyone else can do it. Because we clearly now want an agreement that protects our industry, protects our members. If we can pull that off, then that's what our role is. If they don't want to do that with us or they try to go without us, then we'll react again, as we always do. And we will fight for that right. We've now got that right. We're in the room. Stop fighting. Now let's start building. Thanks, Dave. Um, uh, quite a few questions come in. I mean, one of the questions that's really, really regular, which I've uh, on the session tonight, which I've, I suppose is, 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 a, is a massive compliment, is members worried at, uh, or asking, you know, will Royal Mail honour the terms of the Four Pillars? agreement which i suppose the, the positive that is you know it shows how proud members are to have fought and won that that agreement i mean you you were clear in the joint statement that royal mail 
had committed to abiding by our, our national agreements. Is that still the case to reassure members? Yep. And uh, what, what we're setting up in the way we've structured these negotiations is these key points of the joint, joint statement don't get lost. So the main negotiating group at the top, uh, at the, top uh, the different conversations we have, if you like, if you want to put it in boxes, is 11 boxes that represent the key statements in the joint statement. And right up top, of course, it was about rebuilding trust, uh, creating the right environment, a positive environment within the workplace, and also the recommitment to all of our agreements. So everything we do now, we will be constantly taking back and checking it against that statement. That is a key statement right up front, right at the top. And we'll be checking when we reach what we think is a consensus on, on any of the aspects we've got to deal with. We will say, right, we, we need to cross-reference here. Does it meet those objectives? You know, does it? Will it help rebuild trust? Uh, does it, you know, create a more positive workplace? And that, is, it in, is it consistent with our agreements, the four pillars and all our other agreements? So, no, none of that's being lost. Uh, Chris, I assure everybody that we've been clear, the company's been clear that they are committed to our agreements. Um, we've been clear that we would expect them to, to be honoured. And we think our agreements allow us all the scope we need to treat us with respect and, and also ensure that we can have our input. We know this industry inside out, our members do, our reps do, this union have the opportunity to shape it. If we do that, then there's nothing to fear in our agreements. We can deal with whatever the challenges we're facing. Thank you, Terry. Um, a uh, comment that's come up again, people are uh, two, twofold, just saying who are in these negotiations from the union? Uh, you know, have you got, uh, from a CBU perspective, you've got support of your top team and are Royal Mail attending the talks at a senior level? Yep. <clears throat> and uh, to to show how serious it is in the, in the sort of main negotiating group, it's, uh, it's Stuart Simpson, who's the CEO. Uh, there's also Akin Dunwall, who's like the uh, operations director for the, the Royal Mail. Um, and it, it, all their top teams, the top directors, HR, etc., are in the room. Um, when we have breakout sessions, and I'm in the room with, with all the uh, CW officers, and where there are breakout uh, groups that need to be put together to negotiate certain aspects around delivery or whatever, then... Mark Bolsh as the national officer, for example, or Davy Robertson, um, uh, for example, will have executive members with them. And as I say, experts that we use in the field or senior field officials, anyone who's, who's we think will help us come out with the most productive outcome, they'll be in the room with them. And we have insisted that when they go off in the breakout tools, then I say we've insisted. I mean, we let, let me put it this way. We've spoken it through and the company have absolutely agreed with us that one of the frustrations we've had the last couple of years is the national officers have not been facing up to decision makers. And so it's almost impossible to move anything forward or resolve anything. Uh, both parties are now agreed that if you're going off in groups to make decisions, there's got to be decision makers in the room. So you've got to be meeting someone with authority to make an agreement. And because Royal Mail have a structure which is strategic and then operational, we have also agreed that it's most important that when our national officers are in a room with our team, uh, Royal Mail need to put in that room uh, people with authority from both the strategic and the operational spheres of the company. So it most definitely is the most high level people. Um, there is there is uh, there is a there is some issue because Royal Mail at this moment in time are, uh, are still sorting out their managerial structure. As you know, they've made an announcement. There's uh, twenty percent of managers. Uh, them jobs are going. That's 20%. That's the biggest uh, reduction in managers ever. Um, so there's over 2,000 um, managers who, who, who won't be with us in the future. Um, I presume you know, are, are trying to make sure that's dealt with in the right way for their members, uh, managers. Um, but all that is still being sorted out. So to some degree, until that's done, we won't absolutely know exactly their structure uh, and who are the main people when they when they devise that structure but what we do know is the people they're putting in the room now they're telling us our people with full authority to make an agreement and at the very top so say Stuart Simpson like in Dunwall they are in the room uh, and they are available and they're making themselves available to me anytime I, I need to talk to them if, if there's a meeting that Stuart Simpson's not had 
or there's a problem that comes up, then we're in there dealing with it. And we are totally focused on making sure that we create the right environment. We've got to set the example at the top. If we can set the example then and gradually that filters down, then perhaps people will start talking to each other and having more empathy and dealing with it. Because personally, I've got no doubt when we've got a challenge locally in the workplace, if you truly let the rep and the manager loose to make some decisions and give them the autonomy, they'll come up with an answer, probably far quicker than we will, because they're the ones on the, you know, the cold face, if you like, every day facing that challenge. And our members have got so much experience and they've got so many answers. Give people a bit of autonomy. If we work together, we can get through it. That's that's the sort of theme, really, of, of what we're trying to create. Thanks, Terry. Um, well, another question that's come up regularly and one you and I have discussed is uh, around timescales. Uh, what, what's your sort of feeling for how long this is going to take? And I know some, some of that's how long is a bit of string because it's really critical stuff. And also, we will be communicating uh, effectively with the members throughout that process. Uh, you know, absolutely. You you won't let me do anything else, Chris. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've set a very high bar. We've had a conversation with Royal Mail about communications. Um, you know, they've upped their game and in the last two years as well. Uh, and in the modern world, people people want to know. So, like today, it's it's. You know, some people might think it's not not a massive message, but it's important to it just makes people know what's going on. So and it's not a problem to to come on and do it. We've spoke about protocols on communications. It's going to be really important. What we've you know, basically, we're, we're approaching that as adults. If we feel we need to communicate with our members, we don't expect to have to get permission of Royal Mail and nor them if they're communicating. But what we've said is all the time we are working together to, on a solution then a core message, we shouldn't deviate from the core message or we shouldn't be doing anything, going out doing comms to deliberately undermine the process. We've also said as adults, when we hit something that's really difficult, we can report it and say that it's really difficult. But unless we've majorly fallen out, we will report it on the basis, listen, we've got this, this is a real challenge, this is difficult, but we're trying to work our way through it. But we can still report where we are on it. I mean, we're not... It is time that, you know, we let's not insult the intelligence of anyone in our organisation. Tell people how, how it is. Uh, and all the time we're both committed to making this work, then, you know, you wouldn't go out and stir things up for the sake of it, would you? You, you just you just tell it as it is, be honest, and say we're determined to stay in a room and sort it out. And I think ultimately that's what, that's what all our members want. They want to get stuff sorted out and they want to know that they're secure again. They want to know what the future looks like. So we're, we're really determined, Chris. Uh, we're really determined to, to do that. But we will never drop the, the way we communicate with our members. So, I mean, the first thing we've got to deal with, I'll say this, you remember we were, we were saying rather than structured revisions, we need to look in every workplace, allow the manager and a rep in every workplace to see whether we can do new revision activity um, that helps us with the current situation, maybe uh, makes things uh, better in a workplace as well in terms of design, which enable us to get on with the big ticket issues we got to talk about, which is the future design of the company and, and everything else that goes with it. So that's the immediate bit of work that's taking place as we speak. You know, there was meetings this morning, there's, meet, there's meetings tomorrow and there's meetings uh, uh, Monday, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is every day there's something going on to try and move this forward. I'm sure that members will be heartened by that. As, as they, you know, and, and I think that you, you, you know, Terry, you've been in the union a long, long time, come through, through the ranks. You know uh, our members better than anyone. Um, but, you know, they can see them on feed now. And, and I suppose you know, that what, what's, whilst it's really welcomed the general update, people are saying, well, what about my pay? What about short working week? What about the USO? What about the shared bands? And, and slightly to the side of that, quite a few questions as well about where we are with the pensions. So, like, you know, I suppose, we, you know, people are hungry for information. I suppose, you know, is it a case of, like, when you get there, we, we will let people know everything is in one collective piece? Yeah, I, I mean, we will uh, we will agree at each stage what moves on. I mean, you know, in the joint statement, we've said the uh, a pay for 2020 has got to be resolved. Now, uh, given the company's financial position, some people may may say who ain't in our organization may say well that's crazy isn't it the, the, the sort of position they're in but no we don't believe it is um 
if I'm honest, I think there's a which are, we've expressed this view. I think there's a debt of honour to our members that have, worked, that have worked through this, um, you know, this crisis and have, have been absolutely fantastic in everyone's eyes. No one's no one's down that the, you know, the brand of this company is is through the roof. I mean, people are well back in love with uh, Royal Mail. That, that unfortunately, that love isn't enough to take away all the challenges we've got. But our stock, you know, in this country is huge. And if there's things we've got to do because of the financial challenge that not just us, but every company in this country is facing now, we're, we're demanding, you know, obviously we're saying there shouldn't be an overreaction. There shouldn't be a knee-jerk reaction. If, uh, if as, as the company are saying, it has to be some sort of recovery plan. And I think everyone, even the government, will be having to look at a recovery plan for uh, the cost of the impact of, of this crisis and everything else. And if it's accelerated the trend of letter decline, which it has, and we don't know how that's going to come back, etc., then there has to be some sort of a recovery plan in place, and we're dealing with that. But in a recovery plan, I don't mean to say you you only invest in technology and you only invest in, in in everything other than your people. It's important you still keep investing in your people. So, yeah, there, we haven't changed our position. There should still be a, a pay award for this year. Uh, that's going to be part of these uh, these talks in terms of our pension i mean the the progress on the pension is fantastic that's now that the uh, the lords and, and the commons is sitting again that's on its journey there's 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 real belief always careful with this because it's so many things are interrupted we've all forgot about brexit but that interrupted everything for a couple of years as well um in terms of legislation or trying to get legislation through um, but we're we're really genuinely hoping that's going to have royal assent, you know, uh, around about sort of November or something like that, royal assent. And next year at some point, we thought it'd be April, but it may be a bit later because of the delays we've had with with the Lords and that being closed. Um, next year, we could have our new pension scheme. Now, that's another thing, you know, we, we want all these things, we want to protect all these things. And I think it's um, it's naive to think that we can we can have everything we want if the company's not successful, you know what I mean? As an organisation, it is a private company. It's got shareholders. It's got banks chasing it down and everything else. So we have to be alive to that. But our position is that's not a reason to panic. We've got a, we've got a problem. We've got some issues that have come up. As serious as they may be, it needs a serious response. And the serious response that works will only, will only happen if it's agreed with this trade union, that's for sure. And the only reason that we've been where we've been for the last two years is because, in my opinion, we were disrespected. We were treated like a bolt on at the side um, and uh, an organisation that just gets told what's going to happen rather than sitting down and negotiating and working through problems with us. And that, that was the main, really, that was the main bone of contention. We refused to have that. We're too strong. Our members back us. You've got to listen to us. And by the way, we have got things worth saying. And there's a consequence of that. And over the years, it's proved it. This organisation going forward will be successful and it will look better, not just for customers or for shareholders, but better for our members as well going forward. That's that's the real deal. And that's the one we will get. Well, thanks, Terry. One more specific question, and I'm going to let you uh, round up and get your final message across to the members. Lots of, um, not lots, actually, quite a few people asking about, uh, I think, on the back of the managerial redundancy announcement will will there be voluntary redundancies out of this uh, process uh, some people like fearing that or some people wanting that i suppose you know given that your job primary job is to protect jobs i'm not sure that you know what you would think of that but um just just a view on that terry well uh, i said earlier the way the way i deal with that is I, i'm not talking about uh, sort of job losses and redundancies they may they, they may seem like a strange way of putting it I don't talk about that. I talk about where we've got surpluses because there's a fundamental difference in forcing people out of business to letting them go on a voluntary basis. And there will be people that have served many years who might think it is their time to, to leave the business if there's an opportunity to do that. Where there's surpluses, we've got agreements, haven't we? So as long as we agree it's a surplus and it's not just a, a managerial interpretation, where we agree there's a surplus, how do you deal with that surplus? Um, well, we we have voluntary redundancy and everything's nothing's done by compulsion. So there's other opportunities for people where they can, you know, buy down hours. And we've done this over the years. I mean, let us not forget we had things like mail centre rationalisation. We've had some massive things this union has had to cope and had to deal with. 
which is why we take great exception when you get managers or CEOs trying to suggest we're a union that don't deal with change because it's the track record isn't there. It's absolute nonsense. So what I'd say to people is the main thing is as long as surpluses are dealt with in a voluntary basis and everyone accepts that, then everyone is protected because that means you lead by choice. If, if you get a situation where you've got to carry a surplus or whatever, then you do everything in your power to ensure that, you know, those people are sort of gainfully employed and everyone's, everyone's looked after. Will we have less people? Well, the more automation you get and in, with more parcels coming in, that there will be parcel automation. Every, all of our competitors have got parcel automation. Same way as we automated letters, people will want to automate parcels, which for us at the moment is hugely handled manually. Then if you do it with a machine, you need less people, don't you? So all, all the more reason why you have to have this, this very firm line about no compulsory redundancy so that we can deal with that in a manner that everyone's comfortable with. That's 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 the way to look at it. When you when we talk about mass job losses and things like that, to me that's more when an employer just comes in and says it's happening and and people come to work on a Friday and 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 Friday night they're going home not knowing what their future holds for them. That's that's not how we deal with it. It's not how we've dealt with it. And as far as we're concerned and if we're honoring our agreements, that's not how we deal with them situations going forward. Thanks, Terry. So, I mean, obviously, you know, this was meant to be a brief update. I've kept you on I and mean, you've been answering the members' questions, as I know you love doing anyway, but uh, I'll give you a chance for a moment or so to sum up with your final messages to members. Yeah, th yeah thanks, Chris. Well, I mean, thanks for listening, whoever's listening. I, and I, I hope it's, uh, it's, it's useful to people to understand. I know there are still massive challenges in the workplace. I know there will still be very difficult relationships out there. And I think that's... Um, when you've been through what we've been through for two years, then that's to, you know it's understandable. You have to you have to accept that we're going to have to support people and take people to the right place. But the example has to be set at the top, and at the moment that example is being set at the top. So I will only, and I'm always only, absolutely honest and straight with you. We're back in the room. We're being treated with respect, and I believe there is a genuine desire to have a solution to whatever challenges the company face, which is one which is agreed with this trade union. And if that's what happens and there's an agreement with this trade union, I'm not saying everyone would love it. No one likes change. I know you don't like change. Nobody does. You're, you're not exceptional in that, in that, in that uh, sphere either because no one, no one really likes change, do we? But there'll be change and people may not like it. But what I know is if that's agreed with this trade union, the CWU, that will be agreement that genuinely uh, protects all of our members and protects this this great public service. That's where we want to be. So thanks, Terry. Thanks for taking the time and come on. I know I'll probably give it. I'll give you. I'll give you a week off, mate. Then we'll be harassing you to come back on and have a chat with the members. But seriously, thanks for taking the time to speak to us. But more importantly, thanks for everyone, the thousands of you who've tuned in across all of our channels. I know Terry really appreciates you turning out. And if you could keep sharing the link because and go into the workplace and carry on the conversation tomorrow, we'd really appreciate it. But from Terry and myself, good afternoon, everyone. Cheers. It's been a pleasure.